SpaceX had successfully completed the record-breaking 31-engine static fire. This seemed to be the last big technical hurdle that SpaceX needed to accomplish before getting ready for a launch attempt. In addition, Gwen Shotwell, SpaceX's president and chief operating officer, also revealed that the full static fire was really the final ground test that we can do before we let them up and go. It was not immediately clear after the test Thursday whether SpaceX would try again to ignite all 33 engines on the Super Heavy booster in a future test firing before attempting to launch the rocket into orbit. But now, it's time to analyze everything about the first Starship orbital flight, and I'm sure it'll definitely be more thrilling than you might think. SpaceX has been working hard on the development of its Starship spacecraft with the goal of conducting its first orbital launch next month. The first orbital launch of the Starship is expected to be a major milestone for SpaceX as it will demonstrate the capabilities of the spacecraft and pave the way for future missions to the moon, Mars, and beyond. The company's founder Elon Musk has stated that the ultimate goal of SpaceX is to make humanity a multi-planetary species, and the first orbital launch of the Starship will be an important step towards achieving that goal. SpaceX has a reputation for pushing the boundaries of space technology and for challenging the traditional aerospace industry. The first orbital launch of the Starship is expected to be a historic moment in the history of space exploration, and many people are excited to see what SpaceX will accomplish with this revolutionary new spacecraft. On the first orbital mission, the SpaceX application with the FCC sought a communications license for an experimental orbital demo and recovery test of the Starship test vehicle, launching from its Starbase Center in Boca Chica. The booster stage will separate approximately 170 seconds into the flight and then perform a touchdown in the Gulf of Mexico 20 miles from shore. The 164-foot tall orbital part of Starship, which will eventually be able to carry a crew and 100 plus tons of equipment, will fly between the Florida Straits and head around much of the planet, reaching a maximum altitude of 155 miles in low Earth orbit before performing a powered, targeted soft landing off Kauai, SpaceX said. The flight is expected to take 90 minutes as Starship enters its landing approach likened to a speed-reducing belly flop, a sonic boom will be created. Starship will then sink in the Navy's Pacific Missile Range Facility, according to plans for the historic flight, and join dozens of warships that have gone down over past decades during Navy sink exercises in waters 15,000 feet deep. Kauai is the northernmost of the main Hawaiian islands. Modeling of the spacecraft's flight shows it passing north of the other major islands in a west-to-east direction should it miss its landing mark. As for the safety of Hawaii's population, the FAA is responsible for protecting the public during commercial space transportation launch and re-entry operations, and the license evaluation includes a review of public safety during the re-entry of the vehicle. We also don't need to worry much as no member of the public has ever been injured from a re-entry vehicle operation. It'd be relatively easy to barge the landed starships from a Pacific island back to Texas. PMRF is the world's largest instrumented range capable of supporting surface, subsurface, and space operations. The Navy said the facility has over 1,100 square miles of instrumented underwater range and over 42,000 square miles of controlled airspace. Last year, U.S. Indo-Pacific Command said PMRF was in discussions with SpaceX for limited support and use of their range for ocean touchdown. For Ship 24's mate Booster 7, the plan is that it will separate, perform a partial return, and land in the Gulf of Mexico or return to Starbase and be caught by the launch tower. This is a pretty risky plan. For a booster or Starship catch, the rocket will approach the tower, enter the gap between the splayed arms, hover in place while the arms close around it, and eventually come to rest on hard points that appear to offer about as much surface area as a coffee table. Based on a simulation of the process shown by Elon Musk, calling it a catch is a misnomer, as the arms will mainly move in one dimension, which is open or closed, and can't actually grab the rocket in any real sense. As Bill and shown, they are closer to a tiny fixed landing platform capable of minor last-second positioned adjustments. 
Eventually, the chopsticks could shave a small amount of time off of post-recovery processing, removing the need for a crane or the same arms to attach to a landed booster or ship. They could also shave off the dry mass required for landing legs, though all interplanetary ships will still need legs. However, they will also inherently make proving their own efficacy a nightmare. By all appearances, the current recovery mechanisms on the arms and the landing hardpoints on ships and boosters mean that a catch could fail if either stage is more than a foot or two from a perfect bullseye or rotated a few degrees in the wrong direction. With the method SpaceX has devised, even the tiniest error could easily end with a massive pressurized partially fueled rocket destroying the chopsticks and plummeting a few hundred feet to the ground, guaranteeing an explosion that could damage surrounding infrastructure or start fires that might. In the event of larger anomalies during a landing attempt, Starship or Super Heavy could accidentally impact the launch tower, damaging or even outright destroying the skyscraper-sized structure. Ultimately, the immense risk posed by any catch attempt means that unless SpaceX has miraculously gotten the design of everything involved nearly perfect on its first try, the company will have to be extraordinarily cautious and expend a large number of ships and boosters to avoid rendering its only Starship launch tower unusable. Finally, NASA, for its part, wants to fly a WB-57 high-altitude research jet close enough to the 30-foot-wide Starship's hypersonic re-entry to gauge the surface temperature of the star brick thermal tiles that will take the brunt of the heat. Controllable fins will keep Starship in the right position. Current state-of-the-art thermal protection systems, or TPS, including ablators, ceramic tiles, and reinforced carbon fiber typically require significant maintenance between flights, meaning inspection, replacement time, and cost, a NASA report stated. Starship TPS is intended to provide a dramatic leap forward by demonstrating operational reuse requiring minimal to no maintenance between flights, NASA said. Starship's development is partially funded by NASA, which plans to use the rocket in the next decade to land its first crew of astronauts on the moon since 1972 as part of the agency's multi-billion dollar Artemis program. In short, Starship's first orbital launch could end up being even more of a spectacle than it's already guaranteed to be. This has been Kevin with Great SpaceX, and let me ask you this, are you excited for the first ever orbital launch of Starship? Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section down below. And as always, if you enjoy what my team and I are doing, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. Otherwise, my team and I will see you next time.